Um, we're going to get started. We want to record this session so it'll be available for other students. So um, we've hit the record button and for each of you, you would need to hit the little blue continue button. So, okay. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Pat Hawthorne and I'm the Dean of the University Library and I'm delighted to welcome you here today um, to this virtual workshop. Um, I'd like to extend some thanks to Julie Shen, our Head of Reference, Instruction, and Collection Services, um, who learned about Christy from one of our business faculty and uh, reached out to her and helped to set up this workshop, which is very timely for our students who are entering their final years at the university and for those who are graduating this May. Um, I'd also like to thank Chris Saletta uh, from the library um, team who is managing the recording and does a lot of our outreach and marketing and promotion. And Elizabeth Hernandez is one of our reference librarians here, and she's going to be managing the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So let me just give you a little bit of a uh, lay of the land for today. Chrissy's going to present for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have um, 10 minutes or so of questions. Um, this session will be recorded. Um, so you'll be able to come back and, and view the video um, after we get it up on our YouTube channel. So I'm delighted to uh, res uh, introduce Christy Knoll. She's a career strategist and author. And uh, she's co-authored a couple of books, um, one called Your Career Survival Guide, How to Get a Job, How to Get and Keep a Job in Times of Crisis, and your personal career coach, real world experiences for early career success. Um, I've been working in libraries for a long time and the sessions I've most enjoyed um, putting together and promoting for uh, people in the library profession have been around career planning and management. And I think you're in for a treat today. I spent uh, several days in the last weeks looking at her website, christynoll.com, and several of her YouTube videos. She has a lot of really great advice and strategies and articles, um, I think, that can be very helpful as you're contemplating searching for an internship, searching for a job, and just getting a handle on how do you manage your career, because that's a very important um, part of what you're going to do as a professional in the world. Um, these are extraordinarily challenging times, probably to graduate and to look for a job. Um, but we hope that Christy, um, the time you spend with Christy today will inspire you and offer some concrete strategies to support your job search and some tools to help navigate your real, wide, uh, real world career experiences, which is a large part of her expertise. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christy and I think you're all in good hands. And for those of you who are students here at Cal Poly Pomona, best wishes for the end of the semester. So Christy, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Pat. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm really happy that you have joined me here today to share some information about job searching in today's environment. And as Pat mentioned, it's a challenging environment, challenging job market for college graduates and, and particularly for you seniors who have had to go through a year of not a typical college senior year. So I'm sorry for that. And now you're going into a, a, a very different job market to be interviewing and you know, looking for a job. So hopefully today we can address some of those issues and give you some tips and some insights into how that could be potentially a little easier for you. So I'm going to Pull up my slides. Sorry. Let me get it into. All right, everything's blocked on my <laughs> screen here. Let's try it this way. Nope. Let 
Am I missing the presentation mode that anybody else is seeing? Um, I think it might be up on um, that orange bar. Um, it's like the presentation and it has like a little arrow in it um, or the screen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Sorry for that. So I am, as Pat said, I'm Christy Noel. I'm a career strategist. I'm also a marketing executive. I am the SVP of marketing for Mobile Cause, which is a nonprofit fundraising software company. So we help nonprofits raise money. I have been a nonprofit fundraising strategist and a fundraiser as well. I am a seven time Ironman triathlete finisher. I'm a rescue dog, foster mom, and as Pat mentioned, I'm the author of two career books, uh, Your Personal Career Coach and Your Career Survival Guide. Career Coach was written, co-authored with my father over five or more years, and we were about to publish right when COVID hit, so that uh, derailed our publishing, publishing plans a little bit, and so I uh, wrote your career survival guide to address the, the situation that we were currently in. So today in our talk, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you some stats about just, you know, the lay of the land so you understand that going in as a job seeker. We'll cover some of the, the secrets to job searching. I've got some do's and don'ts, and then I hope that we'll have lots of great questions at the end that I can address and, and, and we can help all of you get to what you need specifically. So I want to start off by sharing these stats and, and I don't share them to discourage you or uh, make you frustrated or, or saddened, but I want to, they're important to understand as we go into the rest of the presentation because some of my secrets and my tips are in direct relation to what is going on. So, and these stats were collected prior to COVID pandemic. So. I think in the case of average of 250 resumes being submitted for each position, that actually could be higher right now. And there's a couple of reasons. One, that there's a, a lot more people unemployed. Uh, two, a lot of the jobs are now being hired specifically for remote. So you are no longer competing with people who are in your geographic area for a role you could be competing with people who are around the US, around the world. So there are, uh, there are a lot more resumes being submitted for each position. 98% of Fortune 500 companies use the ATS, that's the Applicant Tracking System. So, and what that is, is that's the computer that scans your resume before a human does. So again, we're gonna go and talk about why all of these points are important, but I, this is laying the land for, for why I'm gonna tell you what some of the things I'm gonna tell you. Uh, but your, your resume is likely to be scanned by a computer before it gets scanned by a human. 50% of jobs are filled internally before they're ever posted externally. And 70% of jobs are never even posted. So, Again, we're gonna cover what do you do about that? And referrals and recommendations are highly important. 60% of job seekers who are recommended by a current employee have been hired. And if you have a referral that gets you into the company, you have a 50% chance of getting interviewed. Well, if you're submitting your resume just through the typical channels, it's about a 3% chance of getting a resume. So you can see that's where your network really comes into play. So let's dive into the job search secrets. And because of some of the things that I just told you, uh, secret number one is you don't want to rely solely on job boards for finding job opportunities. You can certainly use them. And it's good to know who's hiring and maybe what kind of companies are hiring. And if you see a great job, then there's a, you can absolutely apply. But a majority of your time spent job seeking should not be spending all your time on the job boards. That should be the, the, the minority of your time. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Um, and the majority should be spent in other ways. And what I mean by that is conducting informational interviews. Informational interviews, in case you're not 
familiar with that term, that is when you you become the interviewer and the interviewee is somebody who is either in an industry or has a role or a company, it works for a company that you're interested in and you're picking their brain essentially to learn more. It's not to go pitch a job. It's not to present them your resume. It's not to ask them for who they know who's hiring. It's really to understand. It's a great tool, especially if you're not really sure what you wanna be when you grow up, and that's still me. Um, that you could say, hey, this marketing thing sounds interesting. Who do I know in marketing? Or who do I, does my network know? So I can go and understand if this is actually gonna be a fit before I, I dive in. Or if you really wanna work for Google and you could maybe have an informational interview and, and ask, you know, how, how would I go about, in a, you know, best positioning myself for a job on Google? What's it really like to work there? Is it as great as I think it is? So, but, Information interviews don't always lead to jobs, but they can often get you another step towards there. So they're great for networking. They're great for learning about what industries might be hiring. And then you've got a new contact from your informational interview. And when you at the end say, is there anybody else that you would recommend that I could interview to learn more about this? They're gonna introduce you to somebody else. And so it's, it's a great opportunity to, as I said, learn and network, and you often do uncover job opportunities. But it, great, it's a real eye-opener to understand uh, what industry or what path you might be wanting to follow before you get too far down that fat path and find out that uh, everybody starts at five o'clock in the morning and that's maybe not something that you're really excited about. Uh, networking obviously is a great way to uncover job opportunities that are not posted on job boards. And that's why I'm sure you've heard throughout your college career. And if you're a new grad uh, at any time of your career, how important your network is. And in today's world, networking is a little different. You're not going to conferences and, and introducing yourself to strangers and, and striking up conversation, but you're doing that online. So it's reaching out to people who might be interesting to you to to have a relationship with on LinkedIn. It's finding out other people in your network who, who people know that can make introductions for you. And the key thing about networking is you need to give more than you get, especially at the beginning of the relationship. So if you make a connection on LinkedIn and the first thing you ask is, uh, do you know of any job openings or can you send my resume here? That's not a great, networking relationship. Um, the, the person who's, you know, agreed to be your contact is not going to be super excited about that. So uh, offer up whatever you can, you know, like one of the best things you can do is like them on LinkedIn, like their posts, comment on them, you know, give them uh, that kind of interaction and, and, and warm up the relationship a little bit and then use them. So you'll hear this um, throughout your career if you haven't already, you know, you, the time to build your network is long before you actually need it. So it's not too late to get started networking uh, and start, you know, building up your connections now so that you have a, a, a network you can, you know, tap into when you need it. One of my, uh, LinkedIn hacks, if you will, it's a great tip if you want to make a connection, is to uh, always send a personal note. Don't just hit that button that says connect on LinkedIn because uh, they won't know if you're a salesperson or a bot. So if they're like me, they're not going to accept a, an introduction or a request to connect if I don't know who it is. But if you say, I saw you speak at Cal Poly Pomona, and I was really intrigued, would love to be, you know, a connection. I read your blog post and thought it was really intriguing. I heard you on a podcast and really enjoyed it. Any type of connection that way that you've already, you know, you've, you've heard them, you've seen them, you've read them, and you put that in your connection, who's not going to say no to that? You know, you, you loved hearing somebody on a podcast, they're most likely going to say yes to that connection. So it's a, it's a great way to, to make that first introduction and you'll be uh, memorable. And it shows that, you, you know, you're actually a human that, that has some uh, interaction with them. Research is another great way to uncover job opportunities. And by that, you might look at industries. So right now, it's probably... Uh, has not been a great time to be in travel for the last year, but that's that's changing. Uh, healthcare obviously is a great industry right now. Uh, 
delivery companies, home DIY type of projects. So uh, looking into what industries are growing, what kinds of roles, customer service roles are growing, um, you know, insurance, tax, seasonal, things like that. So doing your research, figuring out where the growth is, who's hiring, what those companies are, what companies are in your area where you want to live or where you um, currently live, or if they're hiring remote, and then, and then start looking to see if there are openings and find out who in your network might have there. So again, it's uh, not just sitting back and, and looking at the job boards and clicking reply to each job you saw, um, you can send out a hundred of those and get very little traction. You're much better off spending your time looking for and trying to uncover those opportunities that may never even get posted. And then my last tip, tip for this is to ask for help. Uh, people want to help, people love to help, but they need to have specific information about what you're asking for. So just say, hey, I'm job hunting. Can you help me? is really vague. But if you say, hey, I'm looking for a job, an entry level job in finance. Do you know of anybody that might be able to give me some pointers or some information along that line? Or can you make me an introduction to Bob, who is a VP of finance? So, you know, then people know what to do with that and they know how to to be of help and they know exactly what their marching hours are or and rarely do people not want to or follow through on that when you when you're that concrete and clear on what it is that you're asking them to do to help you and then my you know final point on that is always go back if you've asked for help to keep them updated and keep them in the loop make them a part of your job search because they're more they're more vested and Plus, it, it doesn't feel good, again, if you make an introduction and you never know what happened. So even if you said, hey, I met with Bob, thank you so much. It was really informative and uh, I appreciate that. Um, and I'll keep you posted. It's, it goes a long way. And not everybody does that. So that's another way that you will, you will stand out. And one other thing kind of uh, related to that is you can also ask people to be a reference. And that tells them that you're job hunting without having to say, hey, I'm job hunting. What do you, who do you know? But you can say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, just graduated. I'm super excited to enter the job, the job market. I'm going to be needing references. Will you be a reference when the time comes? So now you've laid the groundwork that you're job hunting. And then it's a lot easier for you to also say, hey, I'm interested in a, you know, customer service role. Maybe you can... Uh, know somebody that works in that or something like that. So it's another little tip to get people excited. And, and, and then they also feel good, like, oh, they want me to be a reference. She obviously values my opinion and, and uh, you know, is, I'm important to her job hunt. And so all of a sudden, again, their investment into your job search rises up a little notch. So secret number two, now that you've either found an, a job that sounds interesting or you've uncovered one, is your resume. And employers scan resumes for keywords and achievements. It's not necessarily that they're looking for what you've done. They want to know how you've done it. And a little pro tip is the average amount of time a recruiter or hire manager looks at your Resume, the first scan is about 7.4 seconds. So you do not have a lot of time to catch their attention. So they are looking for key specifics of what's going to give them the information they need. And what they're going to look at is they're going to look at metrics and accomplishments. You know, how much money did you save? How much time did you save? How much churn did you decrease? How many leads did you increase? How much money did you, I think I said save, um, how much sales did you make? You know, percentages, dollars, time, things that they can quickly see and digest and understand. So anything with a numeric is, is always good. They're gonna look for titles. They're gonna see if you have a similar title to what they are looking for. So if the title that you've had is a, a non-traditional title, maybe your company that you've worked at or interned at had some great, you know, I'm a people person, uh, but really you were the HR 
intern, it might be better to put HR intern on your resume so that they can quickly recognize and understand it. And then keywords. And again, this goes back to that ATS that I was telling you about, the applicant tracking system that's going to do the first review of your resume. That system is definitely looking for keywords. So you need to have the right keywords for the computer to kick you out as a look at this one more closely resume. And how you're going to find those keywords is using the job description. If you have the job description for the job that you are applying for, great, definitely use that. If you don't have that one specifically, then use one that's similar. And what I recommend you do is you print out the job description, you take a highlighter and you highlight the key responsibilities. Those are typically the first ones listed or they're repeated, but they might not be repeated exactly, but they, they're kind of saying it a little differently, but a couple of times so that's a good indication that that's important to them. And then you're going to use those terms exactly as they are written. And again, this is key. If they said they want somebody who has experience in budget management, but you said you managed a budget, that applicant tracking system may not find that term and may, you might get kicked out just because you didn't use the exact term. So find those key words, key phrases, and maybe their key responsibilities, maybe their skills, maybe there's education, and then use those exactly how you saw them in the job description in your resume. And I'm going to give you a couple examples to paint the picture for you and hope that this helps. Uh, I am currently hiring, so I've been looking at a lot of resumes and I see a lot of people not doing this correctly. So this is a person who has a long list of things that they had done at the job, but it's a laundry list of everything that is pretty much on the job description. It doesn't tell me how well they did the job. And again, I, I'm a hiring manager. I have a problem. I have a problem and that I need to hire somebody. So either I, somebody left and I'm down a body and so I don't have somebody doing that or I've un uncovered a need that we do not have the skills for. And so I need to fill that need, uh, the, fill that, those skills. Uh, maybe there's a rapid growth and we're suddenly shorthanded. So I need to bring somebody in to, to help me solve whatever my problem is. At the moment, I'm creating more work for myself because I don't have these skills, this re or anybody take on these responsibilities. So that's my goal is to fill that role as soon as possible so that I take some of the work off myself. I know you're gonna do that job well. If you've done that job well before and you show me those results, then I can say, oh, look, they've already, made customers happy on the customer success line. They've already turned, know how to turn around 10 customers an hour. They already know how to do SEO and get my website ranking higher. And so that's why those metrics and those accomplishments are so important because anybody can tell you they can do a job and that's what this applicant here did. They've told me everything they've done, but I don't know if by this, if they've done it well or not. Whereas this candidate uh, has the key strengths area. So this is great. This is an opportunity for a lot of those keywords and responsibilities that I was telling you about that will be able to catch my eye to see if they're, they've got some of the skills and the uh, experience that I'm looking for. Um, they've got kind of a very long area related to some of the experience that I don't particularly love. And then I get down to this first position, content manager and copywriter. And there's some bullet points about what they've done. And there are some accomplishments and success metrics here, the last two, but they're kind of buried. And these are the things I'm talking about where you're saying um, they have increased the LinkedIn followers by 67% with total page views going by 40%. These are important to me if that's what I'm trying to do for my business. Um, they raise the... Re company's readership on the internet by 30%. Again, really good, but, but a little buried. And if I have the, if you only have those 7.4 seconds that I'm going to review this, I, I had to work pretty hard to, to find that for my, this example. So what your resume should look like, and this is a uh, courtesy of Jessica Williams, career consulting. If you need a resume writer, I highly recommend Jessica. And she has put together kind of this recommended layout. So you have your 
a, a quick career summary, and then you've got your skills. And these are all areas where you can put those all important keywords. Uh, I usually put the education lower, but if you're a recent college graduate, it's great to, to put it on top. And then your career experience, you can put your title. And then I always say uh, one or two sentences, a brief description of what the job description is. Most hiring managers know what the job is. If you're a marketing coordinator, you're an HR intern, you're a staff level accountant, those job descriptions themselves don't change too much. So if you did anything unique or different, then absolutely put it in there and give a little bit, but use those bullet points and more of that real estate of your resume to talk about your, what you did, the successes that you had, the impact that you have. And I love bullets just for those because as a hiring manager, I just now my eye goes right to the bullets and I can see increased LinkedIn page views, uh, increased, increased uh, internet page views, things like that. So that's how you're going to create a resume that's going to have those keywords and those accomplishments that are the main things that the hiring manager or recruiter is going to look at. So secret number three is your LinkedIn profile. Hopefully you all have one by now. If you don't get started today, uh, because as a hiring manager, I'm, I'm going to look at your resume and then I'm going to look at your LinkedIn profile. So your LinkedIn profile is not a replica of your resume. Then you're not doing yourself any service if you're just putting exactly what's on your resume on your LinkedIn and LinkedIn gives you the ability to have a lot more information and to show a lot more personality. I was speaking with two of my colleagues yesterday who are resume writers as well, and they were saying that their, their clients were asking them how to put personality into their resume, that they wanted their resume to make them look like, you know, sparkle like Beyonce. And that's not the role of the resume. The resume is really to show your job history, your job experience, your responsibilities, and your successes and your achievements in that. It's not to show that you're a corporate culture fit or that you have a great personality or kind of what your hobbies are, but you can do more of that in LinkedIn. The, what you want to use LinkedIn for is to complement your resume. So there should not be disinformation that does, there shouldn't be any information that doesn't align. So if the dates are wrong or the companies are different, then, then that's going to be a head scratcher and that's going to be a detriment to your candidacy. So they should definitely complement each other. They should have similar job history. Uh, but you can even talk about the descriptions, uh, job descriptions differently. You can go into more length about the job description if you want on LinkedIn. You can certainly put more of your results and your accomplishments on LinkedIn. But you also want to make sure it's not just your job experience. The completeness of your LinkedIn profile will go to help you be discovered in the search term because LinkedIn is, is a search search service. So if you search your name in Google and you have a LinkedIn profile, you're likely going to see your LinkedIn profile as one of the first things that appear because it is, it's searchable. It's a search tool. So you want to make that LinkedIn profile as complete as possible. So when it's got your summary, uh, take advantage of that and use as many of the characters as they give you. You can talk about a lot of different things in, in that area, and you're welcome to go to my LinkedIn profile if you want to see what, what, what I've done with mine. And I talk in first person, so it's not Christy is, it's like I am. So this is where I can share more information about me, more background, kind of maybe my approach to life. I've talked a little bit about being an Iron Man in there. So it is definitely work related, but it's how everything that I do inside of my job and outside contributes to me being a good employee. You want to optimize your LinkedIn profile for to be found. So again, keywords are, are critical. So if you're looking for a specific job and you know what some of those responsibilities are, or you know what some of that educational experience is required or certifications, make sure those are in your LinkedIn profile so that they are found when you are searched. And then there are functionalities within LinkedIn that make it you more easily found by hiring managers and recruiters. You can turn on that you are open to opportunities. You can also hide that information from your employer. So you can, uh, if you are currently employed and you're searching and you uh, don't want your employer to know, there are also settings that they will do their best to hide some of that information from 
uh, from your current company. But so go into those settings and make sure you are optimizing those so that you are, you are found and people know that you are open to opportunities and open to being connected. Always leave, keep your LinkedIn profile current, even if you get a job um, and you get promoted and you're still at the same company and there's things that change, update your LinkedIn profile. Have a professional headshot. And by that, I mean, it's just a head. It should be close up. It's not a very large space. So you don't want to have a full body shot. Nobody can see what your, what your face looks like. Make it be current so that when they interview you, they, they actually recognize you from your LinkedIn profile. I've seen a, a few too peop many people uh, use older pictures of themselves that looked younger, but then you meet them in real life and that's not really what they look like anymore. And one of the, the best parts of real estate of a LinkedIn profile that does not often get used is, is the background, the header image behind your picture. And you can create uh, anything in that. And uh, I would recommend you could, you could put a, a banner picture where you could have uh, your email address, maybe some bullet points about your experience. Maybe it's um, got, uh, if you've got a portfolio or if you worked on some big projects at school that you led um, that were a success. If you have patents or white papers, you, know, you, can, you can use that space to, uh, you can go to canva.com, it's free. And they have uh, images and designs and stuff that you can make a really nice visual to go behind your picture that is custom to you that will provide even more information about you uh, when somebody lands on your page. Secret number four is the need for a cover letter. And I am going to uh, really talk this up because as a hiring manager who's currently hiring, I am not seeing any cover letters. And they are really important to the job search process. And this kind of goes back to that comment about the, the client wanting their resume to make them pop like Beyonce. The, the resume's job is not to do that, but the cover letter sure can. And not very many people are writing cover letters, very few in fact. So if you write one, you're gonna stand out just by the fact that you have a cover letter. And the, by cover letter, I don't mean just an email introduction of please, please find my you know, resume attached for the position you're hiring for, thank you so much. That's just an email. Uh, I'm talking about truly a cover letter where you can, it's you know, a couple paragraphs, it's written like a letter. It's got bullet points of your accomplishments and of your achievements. This is a great opportunity to showcase different ones than that might be on your resume. And so this is where you can talk about why you would be a perfect candidate for that particular job. Um, and the biggest thing that I would recommend here is, again, remember to put yourself in the shoes of the hiring manager and that they have a problem they're trying to solve. So you telling them how working at their company is your lifelong dream and you'd be so excited, that doesn't solve my problem. But if you tell me you're gonna come in, your, your enthusiasm for this role is so great that you can't hit, wait to hit the ground running and you're gonna help me do X, Y, and Z. Now you've got my attention because you're helping me. My job as a hiring manager is not to help you fulfill your lifelong dream. I'm so sorry. It's great that if I can do that, but I'm trying to accomplish the goals of my company, my department, uh, you know, my projects. And so show me in your cover letter how you're going to help me help do that. So you can showcase why you're perfect for the job. You can present more of your results. I talked about that. Uh, you can say that you understand the challenging. If you're applying for a, a job in a nonprofit and you said, I've been a volunteer fundraising, I know how challenging that can be. I've been in the trenches of it and I can help you because of this experience. Whatever the challenges they may be facing, you can address it, you understand it, and you're going to help solve them. The cover letter is also a great place for answering head scratch, scratcher questions. And by that, I mean, if the job is in New York, but you're based in Los Angeles, why are you applying for it? Are you hoping it's a remote position? Are you planning on moving to New York next month and therefore you're going to be a local candidate? If you took time off from a job or you were laid off because of COVID, these are not things to, to shy away from, 
then you but they're not necessarily easy to address in a resume but the cover letter is perfect because you can say why you know i was uh, i uh, worked on a cruise and then the cruise industry went out of, you know got docked for a year i lost my job but now um, but here's what i've been doing during that time i took classes i took courses i volunteered i you know broadened my skill set and now i'm applying for this job uh, i've been caring for a, a sick relative for the last year i've been homeschooling my kids and and attending you know uh, pta meetings so all of those provide skills that make you a valuable employee again but difficult to address in the resume but perfect to address in the cover letter and if if i've got my seven and a half seconds that i'm looking at your information and you're in a different city from the one i'm hiring in and i've already said that my position is going to be local once the office opens up and you're in new york you're just automatically in the no pile because i don't know why you're applying but i don't have time to figure it out so if there's anything that is about your candidacy that may offer up a question to somebody then address it into the cover letter so that they don't move you to the cover the no pile just because they don't know the answer uh, there's a saying in marketing if you confuse you lose and it's a great statement for job hunting as well if you confuse the hiring manager then you're going to lose because they're just going to move you to the to the no pile and it goes back to you can talk about this is where cor corporate culture can c come in where you can showcase uh, why you you don't want to say why you're a fit but you could maybe just uh, show a little bit of your sparkling personality and some fun if, if you are or uh, something that would help align it if, if that's important to you and you want to. And it also just by the mere fact of you writing a cover letter and customizing it for that position demonstrates that you are serious about the job and will distinguish you from the other candidates. This I can guarantee that you will at least distinguish yourself because I'm looking at a lot of people who just went to LinkedIn and hit apply with the quick apply there was no context there was no cover letter there was nothing customized or unique about their resume or their application uh, it, it was just you know it was two seconds for them to hit a button you customize your resume to show me to spotlight all of the responsibilities that align to the job that i'm hiring for you write a cover letter that even demonstrates these even further you are definitely going to be stand out and and be unique and if somebody tells you that cover letters are not important or nobody reads them uh, I will beg to differ because I know I do but other stats also show that uh, in many cases a good cover letter can overcome uh, a, a less than great resume and that hiring managers do give preference to people with cover letters so I really do hope that you take the time and put the effort in to create a cover letter when you apply for for jobs And then my last tip is finding a connection to forage your resume. So even if you do use the job boards and you see an opportunity that you like and it says to submit through your job board or to send it to an email, a generic email or a, a, some type of portal or use LinkedIn, um, that's great. Do that. If those are the instructions, then definitely do that. But don't stop there. Really find that connection that can get your resume into the company on your behalf. So remember those stats that we talked about at the beginning. Referrals have a 50% chance of getting an interview versus somebody that doesn't is only have three. So you just use that job portal to get your resume in, 3% that you'll get the interview. And 60% of job seekers that were recommended were hired. So you want to first, as I said, submit it as they said, but then the second one is find somebody it does not have to be somebody who knows you well it doesn't have to be somebody who knows somebody that is has a connection to directly to the hiring manager just a warm body who can say yes to forwarding your resume to somebody in the company or somebody who knows somebody in the company is huge and definitely necessary as part of your job searching process so how do you do that this is where LinkedIn is your friend for sure. Um, search for the company name and see who, what employees pop up. And then you'll see who uh, you have shared connections with some of those people. 
If you have a first connection, that's great. That's somebody you know directly that's in that company. You just go straight to them. If it's a second level connection, then you know that there, you share a connection to that person. You click on their name, you'll see who those shared connections are. And then you can decide, maybe there's five of them, maybe there's one, maybe two of them I don't know so well. You know, you can decide who you want to uh, identify as to request that they forward your resume to that person in the company. And then what I recommend you do is you send your cover letter, your customized cover letter with your customized resume for that job and put a brief note at the top of it saying, hey, thank you, Susan, for agreeing to forward my you know, resume into XYZ company. Uh, I'm really excited that I'm such a fit for this position and look forward to exploring it with them. Then Susan now has the opportunity. She can just turn around and forward that straight to her contact in the company. Makes it real easy on her. That's the whole thing. You don't wanna make it so it's difficult for anybody to have to do a lot of work or, write their own letter. If, if Susan wants to add a little note and says, hey, I know Christy, she's really great. You should check it out. Great. You don't ask her to do that. Even better if she does it on her own. But just the fact that Susan now forwarded it to somebody into that company, even if you're applying for a job in marketing and Susan's contact is in finance, that's okay. We take that because highly likely that the finance person is then going to forward it to the person in marketing. Hey, I got this forwarded to me by a friend of mine. Um, somebody's interested in the marketing position. Here you go. And just by that person forwarding the, your resume is probably means they're going to look at it because you're not just in the, you know, the queue to go through the ATS and just have a computer look at it. So, so, so important to find that, that human touch, if you will, to get in your resume. So real quick, some do's and don'ts of strategic job searching. Some of these we've already covered, but they're worth repeating. Um, do network to find those opportunities and don't spend all your time just looking at the job boards. Uh, you do need to branch out and find some other opportunities. Do apply for positions that you're qualified for even if you don't meet every single criteria. So this is often common, especially for young job seekers. The job requirement list, that is their ideal candidate. It could be a unicorn. They might not get everybody, somebody with everything. They'd like to, but probably not. So don't think that, oh, I only have nine out of 10, I shouldn't apply. Oh my gosh, nine out of 10, you definitely should apply. On the other hand, if you have zero out of 10, that's probably not a good use of your time to apply for that job because they will find people who have some of what's on there. So my advice to you is even if it sounds like a super great, fun, cool job, but you don't have anything, any experience, any education, any certifications, uh, anything that would make you qualified, then you're better off spending your time looking and uncovering and doing informational interviews and finding other ways to uncover jobs and spend your time that way. Absolutely customize your resume and cover letter for every position. I don't mean you start from a blank sheet of paper every time you write your resume or your cover letter, you can have your standard template to start with. And then you go in and you tweak it. You tweak it based on the keywords that we talked about at the beginning. You can even talk about uh, tweak it based on your results and your accomplishments. I do that. I have a, a set of accomplishments that I have. And it's great early in your career to start tracking those because you think you're going to remember them all. And let me tell you, you don't. So when you finish a project and you had great success and you've got some metrics, you know, write them down, put the date, keep them in a notebook, keep them on your phone. Uh, keep them in a Google Drive, whatever, so you can go back and, and refer to them. But if the job is really digital marketing oriented, then I pull out my successes um, based on digital marketing. If it's more of a PR communication branding, then I pull out those. And so I'm going to tweak those on my resume based upon the job that I'm positioning, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, submitting my resume for. Same with the keywords and my skills and strengths. I might change those based upon the job. So that's what I mean by customize it. Again, I'm, you're not having to 
do a completely different version and same with the cover letter. You might have your standard introduction that you maybe change the name of the company, but then you're going to talk about what skills you have, what responsibilities you've had at other positions that are going to align a little bit better for that job than maybe that you do for, for another job. Don't just submit your standard one size fits all resume for every job that you're applying or hit LinkedIn profile. Uh, and don't download your LinkedIn profile and submit that. That does not work well for the ATS. So make sure you're submitting a, a resume. And again, there's been experts in the field who say that if you submit a resume versus your LinkedIn profile or your ladders profile or something like that, you have an advantage. That sending in a real resume has an advantage. And then we did talk about this, find a connection to forward your resume to the employer. Don't just apply through the position, through the company's job portal. That's a start one, step one, but step two is to find a human to get your resume in. Those are my secrets for job seeking strategies. So hopefully there's been some questions coming in that I'll answer. Uh, real quickly, I did wanna remind you about my two books if you're interested. Uh, your Career Survival Guide is a short read. It's specifically for job searching in a tough market or keeping your job. Your career coach, your personal career coach is a larger book, but it's all short stories written by me, my dad, and 25 other contributing authors sharing our own career stories to help you interview, work with the boss, manage your time, lead teams. It's a great, great book to pick up and refer to throughout your career. And I have a special just for you joining me on this Cal Poly Pomona uh, library talk today that if you buy your personal career coach, send an email to hello at christinoel.com. Let me know and I'll give you a free ebook of your career survival guide. So would love to be able to have you have both books to benefit from as you graduate and move into your career. And last but not least, because I love <laughs> giving out information, I do have these helpful freebies uh, that are on topics that I talked about in the uh, discussion today. So if you need help with your resume, you can download my resume guide. If you need help with cover letters, because this was the first you heard that you're going to need one, I, there's even a template you can follow and some opening templates, uh, creative ways to open it included. And then if for informational interviews, I've got a complete guide on that. It's got emails you can use to request informational interviews. It's got questions you can ask and how to follow up the whole thing to take you through the whole process of using informational interviews as part of your job search process. So they're all at christinoel.com. You can go to the website and click on freebase, or if you want to go directly, then you can follow these links. So Elizabeth, do we have any questions? And I'm going to do a quick check on time. Yes, we actually do have a question. We might get a few in um, once uh, the information kind of settles a, li <laughs> a little bit, but thank you for that presentation. It was really great information. I can speak from personal experience. Uh, I've learned those things the hard way. So yes, that's, uh, that's, I have too. That's why I'm happy to share some of this because uh, avoid some of the bumps and missteps that uh, some of us have done in our, in our careers. So Hopefully give you a leg up. Yes. So one of the questions that we have is, is it okay to fail an interview? I don't know exactly the question is. So if you didn't do well? I would assume so, yes. Yes. Well, it's a little harder to um, rebound from that but if you know that either you answered the question wrong or if you had thoughts about thought later about it and you thought i i should have said this or i forgot to mention this then follow up you know always ask for the interviewer's email address or business card or you know social media profile or find them on linkedin whatever you can to follow up anyway because that's always a must but you could say you know what i i you know really appreciate the time you spent giving me an interview. I, I, I was having a bad day. I, I don't, you know, didn't come across as well as I had hoped. And, and one of the things I realized is I completely, you know, forgot to mention this important things that would make me a great employee in that role. And 
you know, no, no reason not to try. And then maybe they'll bring you back and maybe they were planning on bringing you back anyway. And it's another reason to reach out and keep in contact and, you know, do the follow-up and a lot of things that other job seekers don't do. And uh, just the fact that you are showing that you are interested and really want the position and are willing to, you know, acknowledge that it wasn't your best effort and, but you can do better can go a long way. Great. Um, so we have another question. Um, do you have recommendations for the follow-up after an interview? Um, like how much, how much time is recommended, um, a waiting time um, before you follow up, et cetera? Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. Cause that's one thing I didn't cover here. I would say, uh, follow up within 48 hours. So, and I like to start off with an email follow up and, uh, if everybody's not working at home and they're in an office, you can actually even follow up with a, a handwritten card or a note because not everybody you know, does that. But what the most important thing about your follow up is not just to say, thank you very much for your time. I, I'm still interested in the position. Use this as an extension of your interview. So in your follow up, your thank you email, uh, bring up something that you spoke about with the interviewer. Uh, reference that and then bring another example of, you know, I'm so glad we had the chance to talk about how important uh, digital marketing is. Uh, as you may recall, I've been doing that for, you know, six months as an internship and I worked on these four projects that really made a difference for the company or something. It, it kind of gives you an opportunity to circle back to the conversation and reinforce why you're a great fit and your experience is better than anybody else's. I, I see far too many people. It's great to have a thank you note, so you have to do that. Uh, but just giving me a couple of sentences doesn't set you apart. Using it as an opportunity to remind me uh, as a hiring manager uh, who you are, what we talked about, and what your qualifications are is a great use, and a, in my opinion, a definite use of the, of the follow-up and the thank you. Great. Um, so. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat right now. Um, oh, actually, I'm seeing one. Um, okay, do recruiters usually put in the time to contact previous employers listed in an applicant's resume? If so, are they usually emails or phone calls? So I always recommend you do not need to put your references on your resume or in any of your information. I would wait till you're asked for those. And then when you are asked, I would recommend uh, reaching out to the people who are your references first and say, hey, I, um, I'm being asked for references. Is it okay if I give your information? And then if so, what information are you comfortable with me giving? Can I give them your phone number? Can I give them your email? Can I give them both? So let the person who will be contacted determine that. So some people might only want to be contacted by email. Some people might only want to be phone. Some people might be open to it. And then, you know, pass that along. I will tell you that a lot of times the hiring company will not contact your references, but they will ask for them because they want to see who's on them and that you have them. And sometimes the quality of those references is kind of enough to show that, uh, you know, that you're, they're impressed enough. So it's always better to have somebody who's worked with you better than um, somebody that you know personally. So. That would be your first step if you don't have, haven't had a lot of jobs, but you have a professor or somebody that can, uh, you know, speak for you on, on that behalf. You, know, you don't want to just put friends and family members for sure. And, uh, but, but wait until you're asked and then offer up as much contact information as the, as the reference themselves is willing to provide. Great, thank you. Um, sure. I'm, not, I'm not seeing anything else in the question and answer, but this was so helpful and um, just a lot of great information. So just want to thank you oh. for being with us today, Christy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I've got my contact information on the screen right now, so <laughs> it's a lot, um, but I am on social, uh, LinkedIn, uh, website. Again, the website's got some information. Uh, so welcome you to reach out. There's all sorts of resources and videos and soon the podcast on my website too. So would love to um, have you guys connect. 
and uh, thank you again for for having me and uh, letting me a part of your graduation time and uh, or your early career if you're an alumni and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, Christy, Best we, do of luck. Have, uh, we do have one um, oh, sure. question just to clarify. It says, just to clarify, we list the references on our resume, just not the contact information until it is requested. No, don't, no need to put your list of references on your resume at all. Use that space to talk about you and your experience and your education. And when they ask for your references, and you don't even need to put references upon request, they know that. So some old templates uh, and maybe some current ones to say, uh, put a line on your resume to say references available upon request. I wouldn't even bother with that. Just use your resume to talk about you, whether it's one page or two. And when they're ready to ask for references, then you'll have another document completely separate that's just your references. Hopefully that was more clear. Yes, it was. Thank you so much, sure. Christy. And thank you everyone for attending. Great. Thank you. Good luck, everyone.